Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I guess what we're going to try to do is tap into the, the tremendous amount of experience here in sponsorship and ask a few questions uh, on sponsorship, uh, and you guys can give feedback um, on uh, what your experience is, what your opinion, well, your opinions or experiences are. Um, and then, I don't do you have, do we have time to open up for any questions from the floor? Maybe. Maybe. All right. Um, all right, so let's, uh, I, I guess the first question would be, um, what would your definition, if somebody asked you what a sponsor is, what would your kind of 30-second uh, elevator uh, pitch B on um, what truly a sponsorship is and what your role is. And uh, looking out over the uh, the room, we're outnumbered, so I'm going to go to the ladies first, and we'll go with Michael. Yeah, you do. We're taping. My name's Michael. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Michael. In 30 seconds, uh, my job as a sponsor is to guide you through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not to be uh, somebody that tells you how to live the rest of your life. I'm not the director. Third step says God is the director. So you develop a relationship with God as a result of doing these steps. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. All right. And it doesn't have to be exactly 30 seconds. I was, I was just kind of being given an example, but uh, thank you for being brief. Um, how about Polly? My name's Polly. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Polly. And I agree totally with Michael. That's that's what I believe. What I'm to, you know, what I'm to be as a sponsor is to guide somebody through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, introduce them to the big book, explain to them what AA is about. And I loved what Derek said when he was speaking, and that is we can't assume people know what AA is about when they come here. And one of the things that I think, um, I got sober in Texas and I spent 21 years in sobriety in Southern California and newcomers have to stand up for the first 30 days in Southern California. I don't know if they do that here, but what we used to do, and I know Michael's the same way, if somebody's new stands up, you know, we're on them like white on rice. And, you know, we say, do you have a sponsor? And if they say no, we say we're it. I mean, they're newcomers. I don't know where we got this idea that people interview sponsors, but we just tell them that we're their sponsor, and we start taking them to meetings and show them what Alcoholics Anonymous is because they don't know. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Chris? Uh, my name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Chris. You know, I'm I'm gonna certainly agree that uh, an adequate presentation of the 12 steps and uh, guidance through those 12 steps is pretty essential if you wanna if you wanna be a decent sponsor. If 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 you don't do if you don't do that, you you have a greater risk of losing the losing the person. Uh, a lot of times, without the 12 step experience, there's not enough power in the individual's life to be able to stay. But there's other things that uh, there's other mentoring capacities. There's other things that we can do uh, to try to help the person remain comfortable in AA. You know, one of my one of my biggest problems in my first, say, 60, 80 days or so was I was just filled with anxiety and I just wanted to get out, you know, and uh, I was lucky enough to have a sponsor who, who recognized that. Uh, that anxiety and, uh, you know, made efforts to, to make me feel comfortable and, and allow me to stay because I think sometimes we need to stay to be able to get, uh, you know, stay in the fellowship to be able to get the recovery that comes from the 12 steps. And as a sponsor, I, I, you know, I need to take some responsibility for some of that stuff too. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Dave? David Palmer, Grateful Recovered Alcoholic. Hey, Dave. And that's why Karen introduced me as David Palmer, because that's what I always say, because I want you guys to know me. Um, so the question was, what is sponsor? What is a sponsor? Yeah, how would you do if how somebody would I asked you as a sponsor what your role is and what you feel sponsorship is? So you know, if, if a person in Alcoholics Anonymous were to ask me, um, I think the answer for me, this has been my experience, is, and it wasn't always my experience. My experience was that 
I, the first guy I asked to sponsor me was the biggest drug dealer I could find. You know, if you know, does he have what you want? Yes, he does. You know, <laughs> he's got it. You know, he had an operation that I wanted to emulate, but um, so um, that didn't work out that good. Um, but what happened for me was I finally got to a place through the love and care of other alcoholics where I stayed around long enough that I saw a man, um, and by the way, Chris is my sponsor, so if I say anything that offends you, it's his fault. Um, <laughs> you know, I hung around long enough to want to get a connection to God, and I wanted to find somebody who would get me connected to God. And I believed at the time that I sought out Chris as a sponsor, which was after getting fired from my second sponsor, my second time around in AA, uh, that uh, the book was the answer on the path. So I saw it from Chris how to, how to, how to go through uh, the work to get connected to God. So when, I'm, when someone's foolish enough to come up to me in a meeting or, or something else and, and, and you know, start talking like they might want me to sponsor them, I explain to them all I have is, is what I've been given. Anything that I come up with on my own is dangerous. <laughs> and that's been my personal experience too. You know, my plans are like the blue light on a porch to a moth. You know, it's just, zzz. I come up with my plans and zzz. it doesn't work. But when I listen to other people who've been through the work, who've done things that I haven't done in ways that I haven't done, uh, I get, my life changes. And that's what I want to give to them is my experience, and, and hopefully they'll have that same experience. Thanks. Um, that, you know, you said something that reminded me, you know, remembering back when I first came in, my my mind was not in the right place. My my you know sponsorship picker was wrong. Um, when I went into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was looking at the guy that was the coolest. I was looking at the one that was going to be the part the you know that the women loved, and he had the long hair, and he was like a rock star. And you know, I wanted to hang out with because that's what I was looking for in a friendship. That's what I was look. That's the way I dealt with things. What do you have for me? So I would, my, my mindset was in the wrong place. Obviously, that didn't work, and five years later, I finally got a, a program. Um, but, you know, remembering that when approaching somebody, um, you know, they might not necessarily know what really they want or what they need. They know what they've heard, but they don't really know in their heart what they need. Um, I also, and this is me, I believe I have to be humble enough that I can't help everyone. I can't sponsor everyone. Um, there may be guys that I have to, I will help them find that person, but I might not be the one. I think too often I've gotten stubborn in thinking that I'm going to make you well, um, and not letting go and saying, I can't, um, but I will help you. I will lovingly help you. That's all I got. Um, okay, uh, with that, you know, okay, first, yeah, yeah your, your guidelines for sponsorship. Um, what is the first thing that you would do with a newcomer? Uh, somebody had mentioned earlier, Derek had mentioned earlier, you know, we make a lot of assumptions. And when I first started sponsoring, I just assumed that they were, they had the first step, that they were alcoholic when they came in the room. Um, what is one of the first things that you do when you sit down with your sponsee? Are like, you talking to me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> right at you. Well, first of all, I never turn down sponsorship. No. I know uh, it can be very hurtful, um, so anybody who asks me to sponsor them, I always say yes. And if you want to know how many sponsees I have, I can just say I have enough. <laughs> and um, what I basically do, occasionally, occasionally I'm led to sponsor some girls in different ways, like tough love, um, but that usually comes down the line. But Polly and I are both very nurturing, aren't we? We're, <laughs> we're very touchy-feely, <laughs> very nurturing, and that's the kind of sponsorship we offer because that's the kind of sponsorship we receive. I mean, I was beat up enough when I got here, so I don't need to be beaten up on anybody I sponsor. But I usually, uh, whoever it is, I try to hear their whole life story within the first week that I'm working with them. And if they haven't been to AA before, I have them call me for the first 30 days every day at a specific time and um, 
I have them reading in the big book. Basically, Polly and I both believe, get them through the steps, you're going to be reading the book the rest of your life. But um, I have them read up to page 63, and then when they've read up to 63, I sit down in a formal manner out of the big book uh, and take the first three steps with them. Um, they do their inventory, and if they're, if they're incapable of doing their inventory or they're afraid or they just don't know how to do it, I do it with them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they did in, <laughs> in the old days. And um, I come from a line of sponsorship that comes down from Dr. Bob. And uh, when they did, there were only six steps back then. But at the moral inventory, they took the actions of six, seven, and eight. And so when I listen to a fifth step, they spend that hour alone with God afterwards. But before they leave the house, we have done six, seven, and eight. And there's one thing, at least in the old one in here, I don't really agree with. <laughs> and it says, you know, you need to have a year of sobriety to sponsor. I'm telling you, some of my girls could not get sober until they started sponsoring before it once you completed step eight I believe you're ready to sponsor mm -hmm. some people say just stay one step in front of them you know mm -hmm. <laughs> that could work too but um, that that year you know somebody might die Bill had how many weeks when he started working with drunks uh, he got Dr. Bob only six months over Dr. Bob had a couple weeks and he's out there working with drunks that's, that's the only thing I don't agree about with this, this pamphlet. Otherwise, it's very good. <laughs> so, um, and I uh, basically, after that, have them call me once a week or once a month, depending on their amount of sobriety and how, you know, what kind of condition they're in. Um, I take people into my home. I always have. I've had from one to six newcomers living with me. I have one right now. It's not a newcomer, but... Um, <clears throat> That's just what I do. You know, that's not for everybody, you know, because I'm just older and I can do that today. Uh, so I have a lot of them live with me. I've learned a lot of lessons on sponsoring, like uh, using discretion and how you can enable an alcoholic. Learn some painful lessons. Sponsors learn painful lessons. <laughs> Don't be poly. But um, the greatest joy that I have from sponsoring, it, you know, it talks about it on page 89. It says to watch people recover to see them help others. This is an experience you must not miss. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, since I'm following Michael, <laughs> then my whole thing is ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> uh, and I believe, I, I believe the same as she does. I never say no. I mean, I don't believe when someone asks me to sponsor, they ask me if I will sponsor them. That is none of my business. That's God's business. And so I say yes. And um, the reason I want to say something about that is uh, Dave and I just moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, we met this lady. It's one of these kind of God shots. And she ended up, she was our realtor. And... Uh, Anyway, she had asked about four people in Jacksonville to sponsor her, and they were all too busy. And, I mean, I just, you know, what does that say? Here we come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it says, you know, we'll help you, and, you know, come be with us. And then you ask somebody for help, and they're too busy. Uh, I mean, I just, I don't get that. And uh, I guess I'm one of these people, also in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you want to, if you want to get anything done, go ask a busy person. That's who's going to get the job done. And uh, so I just feel like that it's all a God deal. And uh, and I'm I'm with Michael. I sponsor a lot of women, and uh, from all links of sobriety. And uh, I haven't had a new newcomer in a long time, but right now I have a new newcomer. And it's been just tons of fun to work with her. And um, what happens is, is I, I believe that old timers need sponsors too. I need a sponsor. And uh, so what happens is, is, you know, I have a, I have a lot of women I sponsor that are over 30 years sober. And uh, I need a sponsor just as much at, you know, as, at over 30 years as I did when I was new. I can tell you, I have not gotten over the disease of alcoholism. I still have it, and my thinking can be really, you know, sometimes I can't even believe I think, like, I am old. And sometimes I think, where did that stupid thought come from? And uh, 
So I, I just, I think sponsorship is a gift. I agree with Michael in that uh, I think the sooner you start sponsoring, I had my first sponsee when I was six weeks sober. And uh, I think that's that's what happens. Well, I don't. We none of us would be sitting here if everybody waited for till they were a year sober. I mean, AA would have never survived. So uh, I guess I'm just kind of uh, the old school. I just do it like they did it a long time ago. It worked then, and I feel like it works now. Thanks. Chris, Chris, alcoholic. Hey, Chris. Uh, <laughs> You know, when I when I first uh, was sponsored uh, out of, out of treatment, uh, typical sponsorship was really more about sharing oral tradition, really more about encouraging you to remain consistent in the fellowship. There there was not a lot of people that were opening the book Alcoholics Anonymous, mm-hmm. not a lot of people bringing you over to their house and taking you through the steps. So when I first started sponsoring, I you know I kind of followed along as I had been taught. But there's there's an evolution that's really happened to me as a sponsor, and that evolution has taken me closer and closer to the chapter working with others, mm-hmm. and being uh, and being really um, you know understanding that how you work with others is in the chapter working with others. So <laughs> so you know sometimes it takes the alcoholic you know ten years to see the black on the page, but uh, but I, I'm I'm really trying to do that uh, today. <clears throat> So if someone asks me to sponsor them, I, I certainly never say no. But what I do is before before we make this this relationship, before we you know cement this relationship, I want you to know what it's going to look like to work with me. Uh, what is it going to look like to go to any lengths? And uh, it says in this book that on the first visit, leave the book with them, let them read the book. If they if they want to go through with it, you know, be be available. And I basically do that. I, I uh, to, you know, I, I ask them to to read the book, and then I sit down and I explain to them what what it's gonna what it's gonna be like. I'm I'm gonna be asking you to go through the steps. I, I don't necessarily want to be your drama coach. Uh, when, you know, for the first five years when I was sponsoring, I would get calls all you know every day. They wanted to update me on their drama de jour, and uh, you know, you know if it. There, you, there's always time to sponsor if you're doing it right. If you're if you're pretending to be, you know, an untrained therapist or something, then you're going to get bogged down by two or three people if you're not doing it right. So, so really, you know, what what I do is uh, I I outline the program of action, uh, the simple kit of spiritual tools. Uh, I lay it at their feet, and then usually three out of four of them bolt like. Like, like they can't get out of there fast enough. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, the, but the people that stay become Alcoholics Anonymous members in good standing. You know, they, 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 they work with others when they get through the steps. The people that, that make it through the steps are, are the people that, you know, are very, very important in my life today uh, as, as friends, as fellowship members. So, uh, again, there's been an evolution in how I sponsor, and it's different. It's different today, but uh, it seems to be working, at least for me. Thanks, Chris. So, um, you know, it's, it's changed over time for me. What I do when, when I talk to somebody, and it's changed, out of, I think, out of necessity. I, 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 like, I like what everybody said, but I like what Chris said, because, you know, I used to – Every time somebody was, would come up and ask me to, to work with them, I would take it as this, you know, this amazing gift that I have to handle some sort of special way. And I'd, I'd put aside time and, and we'd sit down and I, and I would do it exactly the way my sponsor had done it with me. And inevitably these people would fire me, you know, and they'd just go somewhere else and find some other solution. Um, and I started to take the approach that, you know, maybe I was doing something wrong. Maybe maybe the, the, this intensive work uh, wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. And what I, it, it dawned on me because this guy down the Jersey Shore asked me to sponsor him. You know, I drove down there and we spent an hour and a half on the first step. And I drove down the, you know, the next weekend and we spent you know, an hour and a half on the second step. And we drove down the I drove down the third weekend and we spent uh, an hour and a half on the beach um, uh, on the third step. And you know, the funny thing was uh, he got to the third step and he's like, you know. I don't know if I can take the third step. And he kept getting interrupted with phone calls 
because his probation officer was calling him, <laughs> because his ankle bracelet kept going off because he was out of zone. He had just done a year and a half in, in state prison and was looking at a seven-year bit if he didn't stay sober. And he didn't think he'd get the third step. Now, what Dave said is maybe I can't help him. Might be true in this case. You know, he never called me again. You know, and uh, I don't know what to say to that guy. I've been given this amazing gift. And so what I do now, um, I had a guy who had nine days. He walked into a meeting. I started working with him when he had seven days. And he walked into a meeting. Uh, and uh, he had nine days. And I turned to him. And before he could start telling me his drama du jour, right, I said to him, I said, who did you help yesterday? He goes, I have nine days. What do I have to offer him? I said, go find the guy with eight days and tell him there's hope. Right? I never saw him again either. And, <laughs> but now what I do is I, I'll, I'll take a guy out and, and I'll, I'll, I'll sit him down and I'll go through the first three steps. How long does it take me to go through the first three steps? Right? We, uh, you know, I had a guy just recently came to, came to my home group. It was like, you know, yeah, you know, I need to do this work. Okay, great. Let's go to the park and sit down and do the first three steps. And I found out that what he was trying to do was, was structure a new marijuana maintenance program. So he could, st so even though he had two DUIs and he was 28 years old, he didn't think it was a problem. What do I have to offer to this person? I got fired by my second sponsor, right? Uh, that was one of the, the greatest gifts that I had. Um, but if a guy will, will go through one through three with me in a very short period of time, typically the first night that he wants to work with me, let's get into inventory, right? Let's get into inventory. Uh, the gift for me became when I started to look at my role in all the things I had screwed up in my life. And I stopped blaming other people. And I got an opportunity to tell it to a man and to God. You know, they could go out and, and set those things right. It didn't occur when I when I just had somebody to call. And, uh, you know, I got a guy I sponsor who lives in Manhattan. And he'll start talking to me about his day and I'll shut him up, you know, in the middle of the sentence and say, who have you helped today? Who have you helped today? How's the inventory look like? What about three legacies? Are you looking at three legacies? What's going on? And uh, it's so easy for me to to want to slide into some sort of easy and comfortable space where I'm not being of service to somebody else because I've gotten something nice. And if my sponsor doesn't call on, call me on it and, and, and keep me moving along, what good is he doing to me? And that's the role that I have to play. And then when I first meet a guy, i got to get him into inventory as soon as possible. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the uh, the next thing that came to mind was, is there any mistakes that you've made um, <laughs> over the years yeah, that you could share that might uh, might help somebody? Oh, yeah, I've trusted. <laughs> I've Trust, trusted huh? alcoholic newcomers. <laughs> I had, I made, uh, moving people in with us, I've had, I've had a lot of people stay sober and turn around and pick up this set of tools and run with them. Uh, but I've had some that were, <laughs> were drinking vanilla extract in their room. <laughs> I had this one girl, woman, woman, she's older, named Rosie, and my husband and I just, we just, we loved her, and she was older, and she was so sweet, and, but she wore this perfume that was gagging us, you know, just <laughs> gagging us. And uh, her daughters finally called us one night and said, Mom is drunk. And I went, no, she's not. She said, I know my mom. She is drunk. Every night when she calls me, she's drunk. And I said, honey, I mean, she sits and talks with us when she gets home from work. She gets up every morning, goes to work, and I just was blah, 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 blah. She's working with others, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so, but she she had me so convinced that when she um, when she went to work, I went, and they all know that I have access to their rooms if I suspect anything. And so uh, I went into her room, and there were bottles and bottles of vanilla extract. I mean, big, large bottles. And I just couldn't believe that I didn't know she was drinking. But um, and her car was full of bottles. They were under the car, under the seat. And I mean, I just felt so stupid. She's living in her sponsor's house and drinking bottles of vanilla extract. That's what we were smelling, the smell that was gagging us, was the vanilla coming out of her <laughs> The vanilla coming out of her system. <laughs> and we, we have enabled some people to stay with us too long, you know, and become kind of dependent. And But they've all been learning lessons for us. And uh, I just think we do a much better job today. 
sponsoring the team because of the, mistake, the mistakes we made in the beginning. And I, too, really believe in the chapter working with others because we're going back to the way it used to be. You know, we're losing our treatment centers. Mm. Uh, government military insurance companies are tired of paying for treatment because treatment usually doesn't work. You know, And um, so we're getting a, I'm a, my husband and I have detoxed many people in our house. And, I mean, I had one woman almost die. You know, she had a grand mal seizure after three days. But um, a lot of things that the old timers shared with me, a lot of things that I've done when they started to go through delirium tremens, um, it's all old, old AA, but we better start getting used to it because that's where we're all going to be. We're going to have the luxury of some drunk vomiting in our car, you know, because we're going to be picking them up off the streets and, and out of hospitals and detoxes, and they're going to have no place to go. So um, I've made lots of mistakes. Uh, but I'm a better person for it. Thank you. Thanks. Note to self, if you gag on their perfume, <laughs> it's probably not okay. a good sign. Yeah, probably not a good sign. Especially if it's a guy. Sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I'd, I've made lots of mistakes, and I was listening to Dave as he was talking about I drove an hour down here to do the first step, and I drove an hour to do this, and one of the things that uh, my sponsor, Dottie, said to me one time, she says, it seems like the people that I spend the most time with appreciate it the least. <laughs> and so one of the things that, uh, I mean, I make it very clear that I'm, I'm very busy. I don't have a lot of time. You know, I'm not, I'm, I can't sit here and socialize for hours on the telephone. I can't do that. And, um, uh, but what is beautiful is, is that I used to do that. Drive, oh, I would go here and there, and oh my gosh, this is what I'm supposed to do for service, and and I would just kill myself. I mean, I was working twice as hard on their sobriety than they were. <laughs> and I was just, it's, but it's amazing that I don't do that today. That uh, what I do is people come to my house. And um, and then I spend it's this new woman I'm working with. It's it's wonderful. It's it's so much different than what I've done year. You know, it it gets better through the years. I mean, I spend an hour with her every Tuesday morning. It's wonderful. And she comes to my house and then she leaves. And uh, it's <laughs> it's great. But I've done I've also Dave and I have had people live with us. And uh, and our experience of all of the people we haven't had near as many as Michael and Ted, but we have had people live with us and have only had one experience that wasn't really good. And it wasn't that it was terrible. It just was, you know, she just was difficult to live with. But um, I'm just really grateful that I had those experiences that I've had. And uh, and it's, you know, you learn through the years. I was listening to Chris, and I, I think there is like an evolution. And I'm not sure it's an evolution or it's going back to the way it used to be. And uh, and I feel really blessed that I have so many people in my life that have long-term sobriety and have done it and have had experience in the kind of the way it, it was quite a while, you know, in the beginning. And uh, so it it's I'm doing much better as a sponsor than I was doing as a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I, I can't tell you how many mistakes I made in sponsoring. Holy mackerel! Uh, Dave could probably tell you a couple of them. But uh, I, I believe that I believe that pain is inevitable for us, but suffering is optional. And I think I think as we grow spiritually, we we uh, we figure out that it's our attachment, it's our grasping uh, on to certain things that that causes the suffering. And when I'm looking back at the mistakes I made as a sponsor, uh, say, in my first decade of sponsoring, the thing that I was attached to that was causing the problems was I was allowing people to direct their own recovery process. They were, I was allowing them to call the shots. 
And because I was very attached to how I thought they felt about me. You know, I didn't want them to think that I was a jerk or whatever. So I, so I, was, at, I was attached to how I thought that they were perceiving me. So to not hurt any feelings or not come off like a jerk, I allowed them to be to direct their own recovery program. And that was probably the worst thing I could have done because that's allowing them to tell me when they're ready to do the steps and all that, all that nonsense. So, uh, you know, uh, part of the, the evolution, at least in me, is I'm way less attached to what I think you think of me anymore. And, uh, and I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite uh, comfortable uh, laying out how I think the recovery program should work within our, our relationship. And that doesn't work for some people. And I lose more people today than I did back when I was, you know, kowtowing. Uh, but uh, but the people that do stay around, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, stay around. So, you know, some of some of the cr- I used to say yes to everybody, and then when I allowed them to run their own program, I mean, I had psychopaths that I was. I was <laughs> there was there was a period of time right right around 2000. Dave will remember this where I went into sponsor shock, and I I, I like I had to like bow out for a while. I mean, I was saying yes to every lunatic that there was. <laughs> And, you know, I had my life threatened and they were all on drugs and, you know, they were just using me as cover so they could rape, rob and pillage throughout the fellowship. You know, it was a mess. And uh, and my, my sponsor grabbed me by the throat and said, I'm pulling you out. You know, you, you know, you, you need to calm down. And the guys like 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 Dave and, you know, people like that who who were solid, you know, saw that, you know, Chris needs Chris needs a little break. And uh, and but they had gone through the steps so so they were they were okay they were safe and protected uh but you know you learn so much from these mistakes you learn so much from the things that you do you do wrong if you if you pay attention if you're awake to it um, thanks dave so um you know <laughs> one of the great gifts i got from chris was he told me, you're going to kill the first 10 people you work with. (laughs) Which has turned out to be patently false, only eight of them. Um, But um, (laughs) I was working with this guy, and I told him that, and he had this shocked look in his face. Oh! I said, no, don't worry, you're number 11. (laughs) But uh, inevitably, I've made, made I think, mistakes with every single person I've ever worked with. I think I've made mistakes with every single person um, who I've talked to at any length in the program, because for me, um, what happens is my ego will re- reemerge, and I will begin to want to tell you things that I have no experience in. And I have found, yeah, you know, I was there on Titanic. Yeah, it was a cold night. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, and I, I, I don't do this very often anymore. But I have found now that. When I'm just being honest about my personal experience, what happens is I feel physically at ease with myself, and it's an amazing thing. So when I'm working with a guy and he goes, you know, I I have this experience. Um, I've had the real gift of hearing some fist steps in the last uh, few months, and, you know, I'm able to sit in a a fist step and go, you know, I don't have that experience. I don't have that experience, so I really don't have anything to offer you in this area, but I can hook you up with somebody who does. You know, I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to be, uh, I don't have to know everything because I can guarantee you I don't know everything. But each and every mistake I've made has helped me become more honest with myself and more honest with anybody that I work with. You know, but I honestly think I've made mistakes with everybody. At one point or another, if I've spoken to you for more than five minutes, at some point my <laughs> ego has reemerged. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Only five minutes. Well, I'm just <laughs> <recovering> now. <laughs> 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 one more question. What, you want to open up? Or one more question. One more question. All right. So, uh, people out there, there's probably people out there that haven't sponsored, or there might be people that are just starting out. Um, what is what are the gifts that you receive from your sponsorship? What is the the importance of sponsoring, of getting out there and sponsoring others? What is the gifts you receive? One of the greatest gifts that I've received from sponsoring is self-esteem. 
You know, I was a person that, when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the person I resented the most was myself. I hated myself. I did a lot of things out there, and I, I was very ashamed, and I had such low, low self-esteem. I can remember a doctor telling me I couldn't love anybody and, <clears throat> until I learned to love myself. You know, and it was just totally opposite for me. I came into this program and I started working with women and I started caring about these women. And, uh, you know, after doing this for a while, all of a sudden I took a look at myself and I really liked the person that I had become. And it's just a result of working with other women. And, he, and I believe, uh, you know, in the program or out of the program, you know, to be a maximum service. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic. If I'm applying these principles in all my affairs, but just the um, just love and service. Dr. Bob said if you simmer those 12 steps into two words, that would be love and service. And <clears throat> love and service is what helped me become the woman I am today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Polly, and uh, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Polly. And probably for me, uh, I am a real uh, Bill Wilson. And that is, Dr. I Bob. have, and Dr. <laughs> well, but for me, Bill Wilson, <laughs> I have been depressed all my life. I have just, I mean, I could write the book on depression. And when I read the first things I read about Bill Wilson, I would just read everything I could find on Bill Wilson. And then the day I read uh, our, our Next Frontier Emotional Sobriety, it changed my life. And I was 12 years sober. And at 12 years of sobriety, I was still, uh, I still didn't want to drink, but I still thought about suicide. And uh, what happens for me is when I work with another alcoholic, I'm not thinking about myself. And what I have learned today about depression and believe me, I get people that have depression. You know, it seems like it's a spiritual axiom. We attract what we are. And I get women with depression. And as soon as I tell them, you may not understand this, but depression is the highest form of self-centeredness. <laughs> and what I have learned to do by sponsoring is to get out of myself. And the more I stay out of myself, the better I am. And uh, I was listening to Dave as he was talking about how a lot of times I will say things to women and ask them to do things, especially be into service, working with others, you know, such as that. And uh, they don't like to hear that. So what happens is, is you start losing I don't need to fire anybody they leave you know because they're not wanting to do what I want them to do and there are just certain things and it's my and the only thing I have to share with another alcoholic is my experience and my experience is if I'm not working with another alcoholic I'm thinking about me and if I'm thinking about me I'm going to die and that's my experience so when you come work with me you got to be working with another alcoholic. That's all there is to it. I mean, you've got to be working with another alcoholic. And some people just, their lives just don't seem to have room for that. Well, then I don't have room. You know, then they don't want me anymore because I'm going to be asking that question every time they call. So the greatest experience I have is I have not wanted to kill myself. I have a solution for depression, and that's working with another alcoholic. I guess, okay. <laughs> I would like to share with you what I have received uh, from Polly sponsoring me. Aside from uh, getting on airplanes and <laughs> those kinds of things, Polly has always uh, shared her experience with me. And if she was in a bad place, I mean, she shared it with me. And that's a great gift because I know there's lines of sponsorship where they would not let anybody know that they were in a bad place except for their sponsor and it's because of the some of the things that went on with Polly that were like one day she told me she just felt like committing suicide you know and if it wasn't for watching her get to the other side when I hit the wall I mean I I knew I'd get to the other side of it because I watched Polly get to the other side and I just think that's the greatest gift you've given me is sharing all of you good and bad <laughs> Thanks, Chris. 
<clears throat> you know, when you look at, uh, it, it's a shame our, our newer books don't have the circle and triangle because it, it, it became quite a, quite a significant uh, emblem for me, Unity Recovery Service. Uh, to, have, uh, to have a balanced uh, AA experience, I believe that all three of those are necessary. Uh, meeting step sponsorship, I really, I really do believe that. You know, when I first, uh, when I first showed up, uh, I went to a lot of meetings and I, I became physically sober. I had a step, I had a step experience, and that helped me to think a little bit better. But once I started sponsoring, and once I started to develop a, a service ethic, which was, you know, not in my nature at that time, it, it took a little bit of doing. Uh, but once I started to develop a, a, a service ethic and, and began to sponsor, my spirit started to heal. And because this is really a spiritual illness, it really is, uh, if you're missing out on sponsorship, if you're missing out on the service piece of this, you could be missing the, the real deal. You know, so so what have I gained from sponsorship? Uh, my spirit has healed. My spirit has awakened. And something that's not necessarily guaranteed in our book, uh, I have gained a series of friends that the best friends I could ever imagine. These are these are people that we would take bullets for each other, you know, and uh, and that's something that I always, always wanted, always dreamed of. And it was really a byproduct of sharing the recovery experience with these people. So that that really is uh, really is special in my life. Thanks. Dave? Um, you know, it's an amazing gift. Working with another fellow. I, I, I don't even know how to put it in words to tell you the truth. And I'd never expected that. I never expected the feelings that I would have when looking into someone's eyes and they finally get it or they get a particular thing and they finally understand that uh, what they thought was reality uh, is not. And, you know, my, my journey has been uh, long and painful mostly because of me. And... <laughs> It's true. <laughs> and he knows. <laughs> you know, and then I sit there and, and you try to explain to somebody, I'm going to get more from this than you're going to get from this. And they just they just want something that they've never had before. And all I want to do is give them something they've never had before. And to watch them light up is a feeling of usefulness. And it's a realization of a promise. And it's everything. I mean, you know, I straddle the world of work, family, and, and AA. And when I'm in balance, like Chris talked about, uh -huh. you know, in all three sides of the triangle, I'm in balance at work and I'm in balance at home also. Uh, and working with somebody else is the single most gratifying thing that I, I ever have experienced. But the, but the reality is, if you had asked me before having that experience, I would have said sitting on the couch eating ice cream and watching reruns of Friends was gratifying. <laughs> but it turns out that getting free of self through giving of the gift uh, in my life is something that uh, I don't get anywhere else. I don't get that at work. You know, and at home, I, I give freely of myself to my children and my wife. You know, but that's just something different because we don't have that common problem. Uh, and here we have a common problem and a common solution. And being part of that circle is, uh, it is a depression reliever. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Um, okay, we're going to open it up. Um, and they've given, they've given the okay. You can ask about anything, <laughs> anything in the world. And they will answer it. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, Amory. Amory's going to ask a question. <laughs> I like the queen of questions. Um, okay, so here's my question, actually. Uh, my name's Amory. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Amory. Are we recording the questions? What? Are we recording the questions? Oh, okay. Um, well, that changes everything. No, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, uh... What do you do, in your experience, what do you do when you're working with somebody who doesn't necessarily out and out refuse to participate in one side of the triangle, but no matter what you do, 
um, or no matter how many times you mention it, they still don't do it. So, for example, um, let's say we're working through the steps and this person's coming on service calls with me, but they don't want to go to meetings or every time I ask them how they're doing with meetings, the answer is not so good. Um, especially since, you know, that's the fellowship, that's a big part of the program. How do you necessarily work with somebody who is happy to do two parts of the triangle but not willing to do a third? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> I personally think it's a, a matter of time. You know, my job is to get them through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, introduce them to the traditions and the concepts, but uh, they don't have to pick that up immediately. A lot of them pick it up five years later on the traditions. Uh, it's hard to get a newcomer to swallow the traditions. However, some of them just thrive on the traditions. <clears throat> but I think it's a matter of time. Anybody who's really worked the 12 steps and applied these principles in all their affairs, they're going to embrace, at some point, they're going to embrace all three parts of the triangle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David Palmer, Grateful Recovered Alcoholic. Hey, Dave. You know, Anne-Marie, um, one of the things I've been doing in the last six to nine months with guys is, and I've gotten a lot of kind of pushback, but it works in my life, is a three legacies inventory. Where am I in each part of this in my life? Right? Where am I in service? Am I going to those dull meetings, you know, uh, the intergroup meetings or the area meetings, or what am I doing to, to do service? Where am I in the fellowship? Right, I'll do an inventory on that. It's, it doesn't take long. It's a, you know, it's a half an hour process of writing it out. Uh, you know, where am I in the recovery part of it? And I say to you guys, where are you in the, th you know, where is your, where is your inventory look like? Um, other than that, I don't, you know, I always get the, the groans and like, yeah, you know, I'm not here, I'm not there. And my experience is that when I'm active on all three sides, everything else in my life seems to always be in balance at that point for some reason, work, family, and, and AA. And when I'm out of balance, I'm not doing something else, right? I notice that I'm irritable and discontent at work or I'm irritable and discontent with my family or I'm irritable and discontent with AA. You know, those people aren't treating me right, you know, and... um so I always try to get people to do three three legacies inventories because they haven't heard about it, but it's a great place to see where I am in the program. After that, it's God, right? Thanks. My name's Andrew, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. I had a sponsee who was on Suboxone. Oh, and she kind of turned her life and her will over to the care of Suboxone. <laughs> um, the FedEx delivery man missed her one day and she called FedEx and went to drive to find him on the street to get her Suboxone and I was very torn about um, I would bring up when and if she weaned off of that starting with a new sobriety date and I couldn't bring her through her amends knowing that, that that's what she was depending on I, I didn't see I, I just struggled with it tremendously and I don't know if you have experience with that how it worked out and what you did. My name is Michael. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Michael. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I have too much experience with it. She's a lot no, of experience um, with that. First of all, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, my job is not to pay, play doctor. That is between that person and their physician. And if they are really working a program, they're going to at some point become honest and do the next right thing. When I quit drinking... <clears throat> I had, uh, I was still doing diet pills. I mean, and back 32 years ago, I mean, the speed was pure methadrine. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we have a tenth tradition. We have no opinion on outside issues. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was an outside issue, personally. But <clears throat> anyway, so I did those diet pills for another three months. But I had, and you know, when you're on speed, you can do an inventory really fast. <laughs> so so um, during the inventory process, I realized that I was not sober if I was abusing this medication. And so I gave up the speed three months later. But I did not change my sobriety date. I didn't change my sobriety date for 10 years. And... I, today I know why, because, you know, when I finally changed it, I thought, what was the big deal? It's three months. 
But, um, you know, it sounds like longer because I quit drinking in 79 and I quit the, the speed January 1980, so it felt like a decade, you know. But um, I really believe if somebody had changed my sobriety date, I would have said, well, shoot, I might as well have one less drunk and might not get back. And I have seen that happen with people changing other people's sobriety date, uh, that somebody goes out and either dies or they just never get back. I don't want that responsibility on me. So um, when I'm working with somebody and I know that they have done whatever they have done, I trust the process. I trust that in time they will change their sobriety date and do what they, and you know, if they have three months, that's a lot to hang on to. I know that three months was everything I had when I quit drinking. And I, I just would have, been devastated if somebody took it away from me because I I was in meetings every day. I fell in love with this program. I worked it as hard as I could. And what happened is it allowed me little by little to give up things that were destructive in my life. And so I really have so much faith in God and the 12 steps and God being the director. And, and every person that I have said, from this moment on, if you do whatever pot, I had a girl on marijuana maintenance. <laughs> uh, and, uh, she did it for four years in sobriety, and I, I told her from this point on, if you smoke pot, I can't sponsor you. I just started, started sponsoring her, but I can't sponsor you if you're doing pot. But I didn't change her sobriety date, and I, I told her I'm going to leave that between her and God. And <clears throat> excuse me. And a couple of years later, she did she did change her sobriety date, but um, it was so important for her to hang on to what she had and not say, well new sobriety date, I might as well go out and have one last drunk. That scares me, and I don't want to be part of it. So I just trust the process. I trust these steps, and I trust God. Thank you. Chris, alcoholic. Hey, Chris. Um, a couple of years back, I was doing uh, I was doing media work uh, and doing an Internet show for um, – to talk about best practices in the treatment world and everything. And I, I interviewed a, a lot of people about uh, Suboxone in, in particular. I, I can guarantee you I know more about Suboxone than 99% of the doctors that prescribe it with the, with the work that I did. And, uh, and basically it's a, it's, a, it's a wonder drug if it's used correctly for detoxification purposes only. If you're, put on, if you're being put on it for maintenance, that's not a great thing. Anyway... Uh, you know, as an AA member, what I can what I can share about uh, about uh, drug use while you're getting sober uh, is is basically is yeah it's an outside issue but but it's well here's what here's what's observable to me and this is as an AA member inside observable to me is that it affects one's ability to grow spiritually in certain cases and our spiritual growth. Growth is our lifeline. If things are impacting our ability to grow spiritually, they're directly impacting our ability to stay sober and to recover, and that can directly impact our lives. So uh, cer certainly we want to be very, very careful and, and sometimes even tolerant. Uh, but, uh, but if I see somebody making a big mistake, uh, you know, I will I will let them know. And usually, usually, uh, w what I'll do is I'll let them know exactly what I believe, which is this is going to impact the um, the ability of the AA program to fully adhere to you spiritually. And uh, you know, I, I, that's just really what I've observed. Can you use the mic, use the mic please? Uh, do I really need? Oh. I'm still also an alcoholic. Um, now, my question, I guess, is uh, regarding qualifying uh, sponsees. Um, uh, I guess uh, I have seven years in the program now, and uh, I guess probably about two years ago, I heard uh, Chris and Chris speak up in the Wilson House, and I was stunned to hear that not everybody in the rooms is an alcoholic. Uh, why else would you be there? And I heard quite a bit that weekend. Uh, about qualifying, as it says in the book. And, uh, of course, my immediate insane thought was, hell, nobody ever qualified me. Maybe I'm not an alcoholic, but uh, mm, that didn't last. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that, about qualifying the process. I mean, we, we've talked about 
people being willing to do the work or not willing to do it, but as far as qualifying whether you're actually dealing with somebody who's a, a real alcoholic. Thank you. Is that directed towards anybody? Or? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Chris, I'll, I'll just real quick, but I think everybody can, can share on this one. I, this is my, my personal belief is that it says in the chapter working with others that you, you should become convinced that, that the person is, is alcoholic. Um, I don't necessarily believe that I, that I shouldn't work with people that don't qualify as a low bottom, big book looking alcoholic. Uh, I believe I believe that if if they do, I need to be of maximum help. But I've also been of help with people who uh, who identified as as drug addicts. I've always, I you know, I I want to be helpful to to everyone where I can. But there's, but there's a singleness of purpose that we have to pay attention to here. There's, there's something that happens between an alcoholic and another alcoholic that may not happen if an alcoholic is trying to work with, with a drug addict. I don't look at it ex exclusionary. Like, like I, I look at it more like what works? What's the best practice? And, uh, you know, really the best practice is the, the alcoholic working with the, uh, another alcoholic. But, you know, I also I also believe that you know I'm I'm all, I'm supposed to be where I can be of maximum maximum usefulness to God and my fellow man. So if I if I can help uh, if I can help I will. Can I say something? Sure. sure. Michael, alcoholic. Hey, Michael. <clears throat> you know, I work with um, a treatment center for the military. Uh, they come to my house every Wednesday night, and uh, we have anywhere from 25 to 35 soldiers. And a lot of them are uh, claimed to be addicts and not alcoholics. Uh, I don't have a problem with it because there's a couple things in the big book that um, have led me to believe certain things. First of all, it says on page 23, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. That's the main problem. It's not the alcohol and the phenomenon of craving. The main problem centers in the mind. And then when you're getting to the fourth step, it says liquor's but a symptom. So there's a lot of symptoms we can transfer. I mean, I, you're, you know, it can manifest in other, other ways. And almost every one of those um, soldiers that I, I always ask them, what happens to you when you drink? A lot of them have turned to drugs because they can't drink successfully. And when they really um, identify, you know, on 21, it says um, the real alcoholic has a change of personality. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and, you know, in the beginning days of the drinking, it was a good personality change. You know, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Normal people don't have a personality change. But I have some of these people, <laughs> some of these pe <clears throat> some of these soldiers, um, you know, I have to really get to get them to talk about what happens to them when they drink. And talking about it and all, everyone going around the room and and keeping it to what happens to them when they drink, almost all of them have come to the conclusion that they have a personality change. So, <clears throat> again, you know, I just trust the process. I do believe in singleness and purpose, especially in a meeting, because a newcomer who comes in here for drinking is not going to identify with somebody who's talking about compulsive overeating or drug addiction. They've come in here because of alcohol. I think it's imperative that in a meeting we're single of, of purpose, but um, I'll, sponsor, I'll sponsor a drug addict or an alcoholic. I just, um, I just don't think I can do drugs any better than a drug addict, and I don't think a drug addict can do alcohol any better than an alcoholic. Personal opinion, not AAs. <laughs> <laughs> the opinions of this time? panel are individual. Yes, yeah, okay, sure. I'm good. Okay. Um, I I believe that there. This is just my opinion. I believe that there are a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous who are not real alcoholics, <laughs> and um, I believe that they get better here. I believe that that. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous helps them, and they can certainly identify with the drinking. Uh, it is my experience when I am working with somebody, and they are not, as the big book says, an alcoholic of my type. What happens is, is they're just not willing. They don't. They're not willing to do what I have to do to stay sober. 
And what happens is, is they're not going to be willing to work with me because I'm going to expect them to be willing to do what I, and, and whether I order it or not, which I don't, you know, you need to do this. I am not that type of person. But believe me, by the things that I do and the insinuations I make, there is no mistaking what I expect or intend for them to do. So what happens is it is my experience that if they are not an alcoholic of my type and not a real alcoholic, they're not going to be, there's just not that, that absolute desperation and willingness to do what we have to do to stay sober. And that's my experience. So um, I think qualification is very important. I, 95% of what I consumed uh, is not AA approved. And (laughs) (laughs) so the question is, do I belong? Well, there's two questions in the first step that I had to answer for myself, and they're in the book. Uh, phrase different ways, multiple, you know, the first half of the book, just about the first 60 pages, is, including the Roman numerals, the first 60 pages <laughs> uh, of the book is about getting those two questions answered for myself. And the first question is, when I set out at night, can I, to start drinking, night being morning in the end, but when I set out in the morning to start drinking, could I tell you what was going to happen? And at the end of my act of alcoholism, the answer was no, I couldn't tell you with any certainty what was going to happen. And the phenomenon of crime would kick in, and I would end up in some sordid place. I just would. It just wasn't fun. It was like playing Russian roulette with an automatic. I mean, it just was no fun. <laughs> um, and the second, so if I can say yes to that, right, I'm, I'm halfway there. The second part of it is having horrible experiences drinking. And waking up the next morning going, I'll never do that again. Could I successfully never do that again? And the answer in my case was no. I've just qualified. You know, and in the book, I become so comfortable with Alcoholics Anonymous. In the book, Dr. Bob was a doctor during Prohibition, and he had the ability to write pres- prescriptions for pure grain alcohol. And every morning for the last, I think, two, I think this is Dr. Bob's words, not mine, the last two years or so that he, that, you know, before he met uh, Bill Wilson, he would take pills in the morning to make it through the day because he could not drink, right? And Bill Wilson says in his story, you know, a doctor would be dispatched to administer sedatives and that with alcohol. We all know where that takes us. Bill was familiar with it also. For me, the qualification has to be, can I, can I, those two questions that are embedded in the first step, the two questions that the book asked me, if I can get through those and the answer is, I can't tell you where I'm going to end up once I start and I can't stay away from it, I belong. Thanks. Thanks, sure. Can I read something? Sure. <clears throat> this, I, just, uh, I, I just love this page, and, and it's called They Stopped in Time. It's on equivalent to 279 or 276. You go to 276, go a couple pages beyond, and it's talking about the next 17 stories in the big book. And it says they stopped in time. Among today's incoming AA members, many have not reached the advanced stages of alcoholism, though given time, all might have. Most of these fortunate ones have had little or no acquaintance with delirium, with hospitals, asylums, and jails. Some were drinking heavily, and there had been occasional serious episodes. But with many drinking had been little more than a sometimes uncontrollable nuisance. Seldom had any of these lost either health, business, family, or friends. Why do men and women like these join AA? The 17 who now tell their experience answer that question. They saw that they had become actual or potential alcoholics, even though no serious time had yet been done. They realized that repeated lack of drinking control when they really wanted control was a fatal symptom that spelled problem drinking. This plus mounting emotional disturbances convinced them that compulsive alcoholism already had them. That complete ruin would be only a question of time. Seeing this danger, they came to AA. They realized that in the end, alcoholism could be as mortal as cancer. Certainly no sane man would wait for a malignant growth to become fatal before seeking help. Therefore, these 17 AAs and hundreds of thousands like them have been saved years of infinite suffering. They sum it up like this. 
We didn't wait to hit bottom because, thank God, we could see the bottom. Actually, the bottom came up and hit us. That sold us on Alcoholics Anonymous. So this page tells me that potential alcoholics are uh, welcome in this program if they um, want to do the deal. And I have worked with a lot of people who weren't convinced they were alcoholic until they read that page. And they could identify with the mounting emotional disturbances. There were many things that they could identify, and that helped them make the decision that, yes, they were alcoholics. Thanks. And I'd like to thank the panel for sharing their experience with the note. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.